Okay, I want to welcome um, everyone watching online. Uh, we are studying today Isaiah chapter 38. And as you see on our screen, uh, 2 Kings chapter 20 is the parallel text. We have um, a few people who are out of town today, uh, but um, uh, folks who are watching, you're as important a part of this group as uh, those who are present in the room. I want to thank Bill again, thank Jan for getting everything uh, ready. Sue, who brought the treats today, by the way? Jan and Karen, thank you so much for the treats. There's, okay, so I'll grab one on my way out. Uh, we'll no, there won't be one. <laughs> Doc's going to take them all. Okay, so go ahead and open up your Bibles. Uh, was anybody assigned prayer? I'll take care of it if you weren't. Okay, Rochelle, if you don't mind, would you open us in prayer? And I'm going to read both chapters today, so we've got a lot of material to cover. We'll get right into it. Father, I am so grateful that uh, we have an opportunity to just gather together as, as women and um, our, with our special guests, our men, mm -hmm. uh, to really um, study and uh, learn to love your word and you even more than we already are aware of. Thank you for revealing yourself to us. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. I pray that you would empower us through your spirit, uh, to be bold believers, bold followers of your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray you'll teach us today. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Rochelle. Okay, well, let's just jump right into it. Uh, Doc, glad you're here. Listen to you in South Dakota. I know Jen it was asked marvelous. me. Oh, it was amazing. <laughs> Jan asked me if I felt patriotic and... Uh, I'm telling you, if you ever get a chance to go to the Black Hills, mm. see Mount yeah. Rushmore, uh, it's just absolutely incredible. So, you know, the, the great thing about that trip, Sue, was my mom and dad went with us, sat in the back seat, 12 hours there, oh. 12 hours back. And, uh, you know, we had a great time. So thanks, Doc, for filling in. On the screen... You have the major dates that we have discussed. It's on your card. Um, 1051 B.C., Israel begins as a kingdom. Saul is the first king. Following him was David. Following him was Solomon. As you know, in 931 B.C., the kingdom of Israel split. After 120 years of being a kingdom, the kingdom splits into two kingdoms the northern kingdom, and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom, I'm, I'm making sure you're with me here, the northern kingdom is called what? Huh? Samaria. Samaria. Very good. What else is it called? Two other names. Israel. Very good. What else? Ephraim. Oh, my goodness. You're seminary graduates. <laughs> Israel, Samaria, Ephraim. Those are synonyms for the northern kingdom. Southern kingdom is called what? Judah. Very good. A lot of people get messed up in their Bible reading because when they come to Kings and Chronicles, they don't know which kingdom is being referred to. Uh, you do. Good for you. Edith grew up in the church. Yeah. She never heard about covenant. Really? Wow. Wow. Well, Doc, last week uh, you finished out 37 where Assyria is wiped out by Yahweh. 185,000 Assyrian soldiers die of a wasting disease. Uh, and Judah is saved. 20 years earlier, Assyria had captured the northern kingdom and taken the men out. They're called the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel and forced pagans in to intermarry with the northern kingdom women. And their descendants, their children are called what? Samaritans. Samaritans. That's where the Samaritans come from in the days of Jesus. Now today, we're going to read in Isaiah 38 and the corresponding parallel chapter, 2 Kings 20. We're going to read about what happens in 586 B.C., the last major date 
on your little card, your calendar of dates. That's when Judah is taken into Babylonian captivity. The, Jeru uh, the Jerusalem temple is destroyed and uh, God's people are in captivity. So, take a look here on the screen. Israel lasted from 931 to 722 B.C. and had 19 kings. Judah lasted from 931 to 586 and had 20 kings. Their last king, uh, Zephaniah, an incredible story uh, about his life as he's dragged to Babylon blinded after seeing his sons brutally murdered by uh, Nebuchadnezzar. I think I said Zephaniah. That's the prophet. It's Zedekiah. Uh, he's the last king here, and this is the chart. So the last of the 20 kings of the southern kingdom is Zedekiah, and he's dragged in chains to Babylon, and God's people uh, are now in captivity. For our purposes, as we have seen, Isaiah the prophet, was born in 761 B.C. So he's 39 years old when Assyria conquers the northern kingdom. But he's in the southern kingdom. He lives in Jerusalem. In fact, there is a rabbinic tradition, and I believe it, that Isaiah's daughter was Hephzibah. Uh, that's a Hebrew word which means the Lord's delight is in her. And Isaiah's daughter married... Hezekiah, the man that we're going to be reading about today. And Hezekiah is a wonderful king. He's, uh, he's one of the most human kings, one of the most gracious kings uh, in Judah. And so you've got Hephzibah, the daughter of Isaiah, marrying probably one of the best kings of Judah. And she gives birth to the most evil king in Judah, Manasseh. So listen, ladies, if some of your kids grow up and turn their backs on God, just think of Isaiah's daughter Hephzibah and Hezekiah. Their son's name was Manasseh. Now, Doc, tell us about Manasseh. He ended up doing some pretty bad stuff, but what happened to him in the end? He got converted in captivity yes. in Babylon yes. and returned and had the longest kingship of any king. So that's, a, I think, a great principle. Raise up a child the way he should go, and uh, he will not depart from it. In other words, uh, your child may not repent in your time, but in God's time, he will. Just keep praying. Assyria, for world's first empire. Remember, uh, you've got the prophet Jonah, who was sent to the capital of Assyria, Nineveh, and he ran, didn't want to go because of those wicked Ninevites, the wicked Assyrians. And I think I shared with you last time, I just think this is incredible. The walls of Nineveh existed until 2016. They were excavated. It was a world heritage site. You could go see it in Iraq. But, but um, the Muslim extremists destroyed it, and this is what it looks like today. It's so sad. Uh, the Muslims will not allow anything to stand that has any religious meaning. So, as I said, last week, Doc did a great job talking about the fall of the Assyrian soldiers outside of Jerusalem. Now, before we read our text, these are three key principles that you've got to remember to understand what you're reading. And we'll probably do something we haven't typically done. And I say, I'm not making a promise, but we may read the text uh, as all the way through, both texts, Isaiah 38 and 2 Kings 20, and then come back and let Doc make some comments, and I've got some pictures to show you so you'll understand. But here are the three major principles before we read the text. Isaiah 38 takes place a few years before Isaiah 36 and 37. Now, if, if you're a typical English reader and, and you start reading the Bible, you think that if you read something and then a chapter after what you read occurs and you read that, you're thinking, okay, well, that happens after what I've already read. That'll throw you for a loop. Okay, so here's 
you say to me, I'm going to give you an explanation why Isaiah 38 takes place a few years before Isaiah 36 and 37. In fact, I could say Isaiah 38 and 39 both take place a few years before Isaiah 36 and 37. Remember, how did people originally write what we call our Bible? What, what did they write it on? Scrolls. Did they write it down in one massive long scroll? No. no. Multiple scrolls. And what you have are these multiple scrolls that have been read to the people that the religious leaders gather together and organize and edit and put it into one long scroll. So what you've got here is a scroll recording the events of Isaiah 38 and 39, but they're placed after God's rescue of Jerusalem in Isaiah 36 and 37. Why? Here's the answer. They introduce, these two chapters, introduce 2nd Isaiah. 2nd Isaiah is chapter 40 through 56. And it's the story about the Jews' captivity in Babylon. So here, as the editor of this scroll, Doc, who do you think edited? Ezra. I agree. Ezra, the scribe edited Isaiah, he's wanting to give his people some context for why after the Lord rescues his people from Assyria, why are they taken captive into Babylon? Why did Hezekiah not save Judah forever as the Messiah? Why are they now in captivity? Well, he, these two chapters give us the explanation. And guys, it's stunning. In fact, one of the most profound verses in the Hebrew Scriptures is going to be in Isaiah 38, really 2 Kings 20. And I'm going to show you it in just a moment. So, as I said, 2 Kings 20 is the parallel account. Uh, as we begin reading... What you've got to understand is Judah survived what Doc taught us last week for an additional 115 years until the world's second empire, Babylon. Remember, world's first empire, Assyria. A, world's second empire, Babylon. B, Babylon conquers Assyria, and now they come to conquer Judah. So, let's read Isaiah 38, and Lord willing, we'll read the text. I'll go slow with no commentary. If you have a question, make a little note in your Bible or on your notepad, and then after we get through reading both texts, Isaiah 38 and 2 Kings 20, we'll take your questions. Any, anybody have any comment before we start? All right, let's begin. In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. And Isaiah the prophet the son of Amaz, came to him and said, Thus says Yahweh, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to Yahweh and said, Remember now, O Yahweh, I beseech you, how I have walked before you in truth and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then the word of Yahweh came to Isaiah saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus says Yahweh, the God of your father David, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life. I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend the city. This is why we know this is before what Doc taught us last week. Verse 7. This shall be the sign to you from Yahweh. 
that Yahweh will do this thing that he has spoken. Behold, I will cause the shadow on the stairway, which has gone down with the sun on the stairway of Ahaz. That's Hezekiah's father, the king, who's now dead. To go back ten steps. This is a clock, a sundial. I'll show you in a moment. So the sun shadow went back ten steps on the stairway of Ahaz, on which it had gone down. A writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, after his illness and recovery. This is a psalm, a song of praise from Hezekiah, beginning in verse 10. It's not found in 2 Kings 20. I said... In the middle of my life, I am to enter the gates of Sheol. I am to be deprived of the rest of my years. I said, I will not see Yahweh. Doesn't say that. What does it say? Well, see. Yah, Yah. Ah, I said, I will not see Yah, Yah. Doc, the difference between Yah, Yah, and Yahweh. Well, this is really unusual. I don't think it occurs anywhere else. Good point, Doc. Good point. I, I'll give you my opinion, and I could be wrong. I think it's a little bit like saying daddy and dad. <laughs> Yahweh is dad. Oh, yeah. Yah, Yah, daddy. So it's a, it's a name of intimacy. Let's go on. I will not see Yah, Yah. Yah, Yah in the land of the living. I will look on man no more among the inhabitants of the world. Uh, very appropriate for a funeral I'm about to officiate these next metaphors. Like a shepherd's tent, my dwelling is pulled up and removed from me. As a weaver, I rolled up my life. Yah, yah, he cuts me off from the loom. From day until night, you make an end of me. I compose my soul until morning like a lion. Yah, Yah breaks all my bones. From day until night, you make an end of me. Like a swallow, like a crane, like a morning dove, I twitter. My eyes grow dim, look wistfully to the heights. O oh, Lord, I am oppressed. Be my security. What shall I say? For he has spoken to me, and he himself has done it. I will wonder about all my years because of the bitterness of my soul. O oh Lord, by these things men live, and in all these is the life of my spirit. O oh, restore me to health and let me live. Lo, for my own welfare I had great bitterness. It is you who has kept my soul from the pit of nothingness. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. Sheol cannot well, think. Beautiful in Hebrew. It says, is. And you love my innermost being. You love my innermost being. By the way, that's used by David in the Psalms as well. Yes. Um, for Sheol cannot thank you. Death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your faithfulness. By the way, this verse right there, verse 18 is one of my primary verses for why I am a cessationist. Why I believe after punishment of the wicked, they go to nothingness. They cease to exist. Verse 19. It is the living who give thanks to you. This is why I believe in the eternal resurrection. You'll be raised from Sheol. It is the living who give thanks to you, as I do today. A father tells his sons about your faithfulness. Yahweh! The Lord will surely save me. Is it in verse 20 in his prayer? Is it Yah, Yah too? No, Yahweh. It's Yahweh. Yahweh will surely save me. So it's a strange statement. It's Yahweh to save me. It has an infinitive. Ah. And I don't know how you would say yeah, it. Yeah, you translate you, it. I translate it, oh, Yahweh, to save, to deliver me. But Yeah, that's good, Doc. Well, I don't, think it's, well, I don't well, think it's good Hebrew. Well, maybe not. But the infinitive would say salvation is of the Lord. Yahweh saves. Yeah. Um, Yahweh will save me or Yahweh saves me. So we will play my songs on stringed instruments all the days of our life. 
at the house of Yahweh. Now Isaiah had said, let them take a cake of figs, apply it to the boil that he may recover. Then Hezekiah had said, what is the sign that I shall go up to the house of Yahweh? Now, I want to show you something, and then we're going to read 2 Kings 20, then we'll come back and go line by line and do any, um, answer any questions you have. People say, um, what did, what was the disease Hezekiah had? The Bible says boil, but let me put it in modern terms. Uh, it was anthrax, A-N-T-H-R-A-X. Anthrax, it's been around for centuries. Recently, militaries have weaponized the disease of anthrax. It, is, it used to be a rare biological disease that was mortal, caused death. Uh, but here's what's fascinating. Even today, the National Institutes of Health have done research papers on Isaiah 38, verse 21. And NIH, um, United States government, says that the cure for anthrax was found 700 years um, before Christ in this text. What you do is you take figs and you make a poultice. A poultice, we, it, it, in Latin, poultos, we get... Um, uh, we get our word pus from it. Uh, we also get uh, uh, porridge from the word. Now, those two things don't seem to go together. Uh, but uh, ba basically, it's, it's like something made soft that seeps liquid. Uh, so what you do is you take figs and you crush them in order to produce liquid. Then you place, you heat them up on a fire. And then you place the warm or hot liquid with the figs uh, on the skin. Sometimes over a wrap or in a wrap, then you lay it on the skin. And that's exactly what Yahweh told um, Isaiah that Hezekiah should do. And he was healed. Okay? Okay. Now, let's go over to 2 Kings 20. Let's do this pretty quick, and then we'll come back. We'll have 30 minutes uh, for discussion on these two texts. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's really fascinating. The narrative chapters of your Old Testament, and what I mean by that is chapters that just give you chronological events that happen in the life of the nation of Israel... Uh, you're looking at chapters like uh, Exodus, um, Ezra, Nehemiah, they, they come later. But then Esther is a, uh, is a chronological narrative. Then the, the important ones are Kings and Chronicles. Okay, what you can do with your Bible is you can take the writings of the prophets and insert them in Kings and Chronicles so that... What the prophets are saying, you find out where it goes within the narrative. Uh, most people don't understand that if you begin with the book of Genesis and just start reading and you come to Esther, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second uh, Chronicles, First and Second Kings, uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, <laughs> the Old Testament ends. But then... The vast majority of the Old Testament is after Esther, right? Yeah, and, and so everybody's like, what? Well, you've got to take those books and insert them in Genesis through Esther. And, and, and you do that when you know uh, chronology. Now, the Hebrews don't have that big of a problem. The Jews don't. Because their Old Testament is ordered differently than ours. Doc, in the Hebrew Bible... Read from right to left. When the Jews, and by the way, their Bible does not, is not the New Testament. It's, it's just what we call the Old Testament. When the Jews read the Hebrew Scriptures, what's the last book in their Bible? Chronicles. 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 
And by the way, it makes it easier for them to understand the Hebrew Scriptures because Chronicles is the, the, the book that ends with the history of Israel. And the last uh, verse is cut off in Chronicles in mid-sentence. He shall go up to Jerusalem. And I think it's a beautiful prophecy of the coming Messiah. But all that to say, if as we read 2 Kings 20, at the top, just put Isaiah 38 and 39, and you'll be like, okay, this is where those two chapters are inserted. Okay, so let, let's begin reading. And you're going to find that it's very, very similar to what we just read. Let's start. Verse 1. In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, came to him and said, Thus says Yahweh. Doc, I'm going to ask you, does kings use Yahya or Yahweh? It uses Yahweh throughout here, doesn't it? I've forgotten. I now, no problem. Let's go on. Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to Yahweh. Verse 2. Uh, now verse 3. Remember now, O Yahweh, I beseech you, I have walked before you in truth with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Before Isaiah had gone out of the middle court, the word of Yahweh came to him saying, return and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says Yahweh, the God of your father, David, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you on the third day. You shall go up to the house of Yahweh. I will add 15 years to your life. I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Then Isaiah said, take a cake of figs, a poultice of figs. They took it, laid it on the boil, and Hezekiah recovered. Now Hezekiah had said to Isaiah, what will be the sign that Yahweh will heal me? And I shall go up to the house of Yahweh the third day. By the way, that was the last verse of what we just read in Isaiah 38. What is the sign of my healing? Here it is right there. But, but the sign was more. The question was, how shall I know I shall be healed in three days and go up to worship? Verse 9. Isaiah said, this shall be the sign to you from Yahweh, that Yahweh will do the thing which he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten steps? Shall the clock go forward ten steps? Or shall the clock go back ten steps? I'll explain that in just a moment. Hezekiah answered Isaiah and said, Well, it's easy for the shadow to decline ten steps. But let the shadow turn backward ten steps. Isaiah the prophet cried to Yahweh, and Yahweh brought the shadow on the stairway back ten steps by which it had gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. Okay. Now, I want to finish this. Uh, even though what we're about to read is Isaiah 39, we'll come back next week. But I want you to see what happens. This is extraordinary. This is the setup in Isaiah 39 for why Israel is in captivity. Let's read it. Verse 12. At that time, Baradoc Baladun, a son of Baladun, look at this now, king of Babylon. This is the first time we are introduced to Babylon. Assyria had conquered the little community of Babylon and scattered the Babylonians, the Chaldeans. But as Assyria stopped paying attention to the Babylonians or the Chaldeans and started moving to the west to conquer Samaria, uh, Egypt, uh, and places to the east. Babylonians got together and said, mm, we're going to attack Nineveh from the flank. It's a little bit like me today. Texas beat the snot out of us last year, 49 to nothing. Well, I can't wait. Until we take their flank tomorrow. That's the attitude of the Babylonians. But you're not even going. No. Every time I go, we lose. 
Well, I'm not going. I'm not spending my money. I'm going to sit down and watch them win on television. Here we go. Verse 13. Uh, uh, oh, sent letters. The Babylonians sent letters presented to Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Hezekiah listened to them. Remember, these are messengers from Babylon, and Assyria is still the world's power. Hezekiah listened to them and showed them all his treasures, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, his house of armor, all that was in his house. Next week, I'll show you the pictures of this. It was massive. There was nothing in the king's house, nor in all of his dominion, that Hezekiah did not show the Babylonians. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men from Babylon say? Why have they come to you? And Hezekiah said, Well, they have come from a very far country, from Babylon. And he said, Isaiah said, What have they seen in your house? Or what have you shown them? And Hezekiah answered, They've seen all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown the Babylonians. Uh Uh-oh. Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of Yahweh. Behold, the days are coming. This is being said in about probably 710 B.C., nine years before the Assyrians are defeated in 701 B.C. Behold, the days are coming. When are those days? 586 B.C. Uh, I mean, that's a, what is that? 125 years. The days are coming. When all that your fathers have laid up to store will be carried to Babylon. Nothing will be left. Some of your sons who shall come forth from you, your descendants whom you beget, they will be taken away. By the way, that's Zedekiah, a direct descendant of Hezekiah. They will be taken away. And some of your offspring will become eunuchs, officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now, this is the most profound statement I think I have ever read in the Hebrew Scriptures in terms of the sorrow in it, how it makes me sad. Look what he says, verse 19. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of Yahweh which you have spoken is good. But notice, the writer tells us the thoughts of Hezekiah. Hezekiah said, this is good, for this is the statement that saddens my heart. Is it not so? If there will be peace and truth in my days. I don't know what your translation says, but let me tell you what the Hebrew says. It's good, because I'm fine. This is coming on my children. Is that right, Doc? Let me tell you, that breaks my heart. That's exactly what people are saying in the United States about our debt. Hey, it's okay. We got everything. It's good. We're at peace. Don't worry. We'll pay for it down the road. It'll happen to my kids. Ugh. Verse 20. Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and all his might... And how he made the pool of Siloam and the tunnel, the conduit, and brought water into the city, Hezekiah's tunnel. Many of us have walked through it. Are these acts of the king not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? Guys, what is the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah. Hang on. I'm going to propose to you, it may or may not be First and Second Chronicles. I think every king kept a chronicle of the things that happened during his reign. And we don't have nearly all of them. What we've got that we call First and Second Chronicles is a compilation of Ezra written after the Babylonian captivity to teach the children the history of Israel. So I'm proposing to you that the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah, we don't have. Does that make sense? 
But Ezra might have had. Doc, do you agree with me? I don't know. I, yeah. I think that's probably right, but I... I yeah, well, it's, it's, uh, it's conjecture. My point to you is simply this. This book you call your Bible didn't just come together in one year as somebody wrote. It was over centuries and millennium as people wrote pieces of narrative and prophecy on scrolls that were kept by the scribes. And then Ezra, the great scribe, they called uh, Doc Ezra what? Second Moses. They call him the second Moses. Ezra put it all together. But Go ahead, it's Doc. a lot longer story than that. The full Hebrew Bible is 1000 A.D. Yes, very good. Before Doc. it's all put together. I mean... Yeah, and here's what Doc is saying. 1,000 years after Christ, um, that's when the Hebrew Bible was finally um, totally put together. Now, I do believe in the days of Christ, when Christ would teach, they had all the Hebrew scrolls that and more that are now part of our Bible. But what they would do is they would roll, uh, they would roll out this big uh, cart and there would be scrolls sticking out of it. And the teacher or the rabbi would be sitting on a chair in front of a table that leaned down like this. And the, the, the teacher, rabbi, that was one of uh, the favorite titles people gave to Jesus because he would teach in the synagogue. Wouldn't that be cool mm -hmm. to sit there and listen you to bet. Jesus pull out a scroll? And the Bible says... He unrolled the scroll of Isaiah when he preached his first message in his home city of Nazareth. And he read the great messianic prophecy and then rolled the scroll up saying nothing. An assistant put it back in the cart. And now, Jesus, wait a minute. Go ahead. You got Bill Blount needs to know that not a cart. They call it the ark. Thank you. Doc. And I guess the Ark of the Covenant, Bill. <laughs> yeah, Bill. He's, they, do, they do call it the Ark, but for us English Westerners, <laughs> it's a cart. Okay? <laughs> but that's what the word Ark means. Uh, it's a container. Okay. So Jesus says nothing, reads it, says nothing, rolls it up. Then he goes, sits down with the people and says this. Today, what you've heard is fulfilled in your hearing. Anybody know what they did to him after that? <laughs> they took him to the cliffs to try to kill him because he just claimed to be the Messiah. And the Bible says that he walked right through them because his time had not yet come. Here's the encouragement that I get from this, Jen. When you speak the truth, sometimes people aren't happy. Oh, well. Oh, well. Just, for sure, keep on keeping on. All right, now let's talk. We've got 20 minutes. Uh, and if you have to leave, go to work. It's more Christian to be at work on time than it is to be in a Bible study. Uh, so, what's your thoughts, questions? Open it up, Rochelle. What's the significance of him turning his back or his face to the yeah. wall to pray? I yeah. mean, that's said in both accounts. Yeah. Doc? Well, I, I thought he had to do it. Turned his face to the wall, a big baby. <laughs> but I think he, there's probably a lot of people standing around. He wants to talk to God. And, yeah, I agree with that. But I, I don't know. Yeah, Rochelle, well, have that's, block everything else yeah. out, like Doc says. And, and so probably, you know, it says Isaiah tells him this. So this is immediate. He gets down on his knees to the wall. And the Bible says Isaiah is not even through the middle court when Yahweh speaks to him. To me, that's, that's like instantaneous. Instantaneous. So I want, I want, to, I, I want to throw something out at, at you. Nancy, my Calvinist friends, they're not always textual, biblical literist. 
what they do is they bring their framework to the Bible and they don't let the Bible speak. Right. Everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. Everybody. Arminians do it. So it's not just Calvinists. But let me show you a dilemma the Calvinists have. In Isaiah 38, verse 1, 2, we read, Isaiah comes to Hezekiah and says, Thus saith Yahweh, Get your affairs in order. You will die. How can Yahweh say you will die? And then Hezekiah not die. Make sense? And here's my answer. Yahweh sometimes speaks a word to bring people to brokenness. The word is for them. It's not a decree of what God's going to do. It's a word to bring Hezekiah to brokenness and dependence and trust. And, and so I say to my Calvinist friends, Nancy, I say, look, what, what's the big deal if an evangelist says, if you don't repent and turn to God, you're going to die. The Calvinists say, well, when God gets ready to save him, he'll save him no matter what you say or do. And I'm like, stop that. <laughs> the scripture uses words to drive people to brokenness. God's words. Make sense? Doc, you agree with me? You bet. And I love that statement. It says, you love my innermost being. Yes. And you threw behind your back all my sins. I grew up in a church that taught, I went to two Christian colleges that taught constantly, no forgiveness in the Hebrew Bible, no salvation. There it is right and there. It's all over the Hebrew Bible, but in statements like that, you threw behind your back. Yahweh did all my sins. That's beautiful. Sounds like forgiveness to me. Sounds like, absolutely. Way. Yes, Nancy. The way I see this, um, what, the vision that comes to my mind is God knows what he's going to do. Exactly. He has a plan. Yes. And when he, Isaiah tells Hezekiah that, turns and leaves, I see God with a grin on his face yeah. waiting like for because like he knows that. what he's going to do yeah. and you need to yeah. see like a father with a grin on his yeah. face going to yeah. give his kid the toy he mm -hmm. really wants and he told him he couldn't have it. Beautiful you know, so. imagery. Beautiful imagery. Yeah. Because, yeah, I like that. A father knows. He's got the toy. He's going to give it to his son, but he's not going to do it until his son is broken. Mm -hmm. And he walks away with a grin saying it's going to happen. I like that. So Hezekiah did not follow Yahweh prior to this. Because when he says, set your house in order, but then you go down to verse 3, when Hezekiah is beseeching the Lord and says, um, how I have walked before you in truth and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. So it seems a little... Well, it, Rochelle, great point. Uh, great point. Here's what happened. When he became king, he was afraid of Assyrian domination. So he goes into the temple and he t takes silver and gold off the doorpost, makes uh, a parley, a peace treaty with the king of Assyria. And part of that peace treaty is we'll take your god, Asher, and put it in the temple. It was a political thing. Well, when did he read, lead in his great revival? There we go. That's what I was about to get to, yeah. Doc. But then what happens is there's this conviction, which, by the way, should tell all of us, those of us who know the Lord, we can really screw up and mess up. But the, I, I used to tell people at, when I was pastor at Emmanuel, there is no sin that will ever set you outside of God's family except the sin of unrepentance. That's it. And you know what? I've seen, Sue, Christians do the stupidest stuff. But when you go to them in love and say, hey, what do you think? Is this good? Is this good for your family? Is this good? No, help. And we're like, no, sin's behind our back. Let's help you out. But it's that person who says, leave me alone. I'll leave my husband for my secretary. I don't care. 
That's when we'll love them, but say, hey, there's no sign of God's grace. Hezekiah, Rochelle, had God's grace. So when he did that, he becomes broken. He removes the idol asher. They discover in cleaning up the temple, it was in disrepair. Doc, they say they discover what? I think Deuteronomy. I agree with you. But that's Josiah. Ah, Josiah. Yeah, not Hezekiah. But Hezekiah restored. Uh, What does it say exactly in uh, in the revival that came? That's okay. Don't Don't, don't worry. Josiah had a great revival. He did. And then... Another revival under Hezekiah. Under under Hezekiah. That's the way I remember. Yeah, and I agree with you. So, Rochelle, there is repentance. Then they stopped paying the tribute. And that's what brought the Assyrians in 701 to destroy them. Does that make sense? So when he says in this text, you know how I've walked with you, he's saying, you know I cut the peace treaty. I took down Asher. I'm following you. And now you're taking my life? Oh, God. Oh, Yahweh for Yah, Yah. Okay, great question. Does that answer it? Any other question or comment from this text? Pretty amazing, isn't it? Great application. I'm interested in your translations, whatever you're reading. 2 Kings 20, verse 20. Read that out loud for us and tell us which translation it is. 2 Kings 20, verse 20. Nancy, what are you reading from? Um, in a... Yes. In, in, in the... Amer- in, New American Standard. Okay. Rochelle, what are you reading from? Everybody's in AS. I got an everyday study Bible. What does your everyday study Christian mean? Standard. Christian Standard. What is it? What it says, the rest of the events of his God reign, along with all his might and how he made the pool and the tunnel and brought water into the city are written in the historical record of Judah's kings. Yeah, very good. I like that translation. Jump up one to verse 19 and read that one. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord, that'll be Yahweh, that you have spoken is good. For he thought, why not, if there will be peace and security during my lifetime? Sound like Neville Chamberlain in the day of Hitler. I think he said those very words, he maybe did. quoting it. He did. Yeah. Okay, I like that. Anybody else have a different translation? Which verse? Verse 19. This is the NIV. Okay. It says, the word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied, for he thought, will there not be peace and security in my life? And by the way, there was. But then the entire nation collapsed in the days of his grandchildren. Yeah. So the actions of Hezekiah in opening up the the king's palace to show the Babylonians had consequences 120 years later. But Hezekiah wasn't thinking about that. Edith, King James, can you read that? Yes. New King James. Oh, New King James, verse 19. Uh, so Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he said, Will there not be peace and truth, at least in my days? I like that. Uh I like that translation. Mm -hmm. At least in my days. Mm -hmm. And people with character aren't thinking about their days. They're thinking about the days of their children and their grandchildren. Great. Any other comment or question? He was so quick to show Assyria all the things he had. Yeah, it was Babylon. I mean Babylon. Yeah, yeah. It was like it was a pride issue. I have all these things. That's a good point. That's a good point. Oh, I want them. Yeah. You know, good point. I think I think you 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 could be onto something, Sue. I also think Assyria was coming. He had stopped paying tribute. And I think he's looking for an ally. Basically saying, look, we're pretty strong ourselves. What about if we partner up? Uh, But you're right. Isaiah immediately sees the problem. 
Now, this is, my wife gets on me uh, for this sometimes. Graciously so. She's, mm -hmm. In fact, one of the compliments my mom made, I thought this was cool. We were driving back, and my mom, who just turned 82, she said, you know, Rochelle, I am trying to imitate uh, your voice uh, because when you speak, even in uh, a word of correction, it's always soothing and kind, and I'm like, what a compliment. So when I say Rochelle gets on me, it's always soothing and kind <laughs> uh, and, and so on. Yeah. But sometimes I just tell everything. I just lay it out there. And Rochelle's like, wait, there are things. I see that, Edith. I see that point right there. I do. I don't think about it. But there are some things that probably should not be revealed. And, I mean, we're facing one right now that I must keep secret. Uh, and Isaiah said to Hezekiah, you should have kept this secret. Anybody else? Doc? When you, when you read this chapter in Hebrew, you get to verse 9, verses 1 through 9, real simple Hebrew. I can read that. You get to verse 9, and all of it says, it says, stop. I, and it's like, That's I've got good, a little Doc. psalm I want to tell you. And it's Hezekiah's, and man, that's hard Hebrew to read. There's a lot of mistakes, to, I think, and, Fascinating. and that y'all, y'all business. And yeah. Anyway, I think this is something personal that Hezekiah wrote. I love that. And it, he's not a, a scribe. Yeah. He's a king. He's not yeah. good at this stuff. He's not a prophet. Great observation, hmm. Doc. Uh, yes, Jen. What I'm observing, and I don't know exactly what to make out of it, but it seems like Hezekiah is basically a really upstanding person who God cherishes. Yep, I agree with that. But he vacillates back and forth into his humanity, his um, I agree with selfishness. That. Mm -hmm. uh, but God still, God, it's a dance. Yeah. It is. And mm -hmm. I love that, Jen. Mm -hmm. uh, Yahweh cherishes. Hezekiah, even when Hezekiah makes stupid choices. And he goes back and forth. He goes back and forth. But Yahweh never abandons him. All of his sins are thrown behind Yahweh's back. But he works with Hezekiah to bring him to brokenness yeah. over his sins. And, and now I heard Nancy say, that's all of us. I agree. Mm -hmm. It happens to all of us. Okay. okay. We've got time for one more question before we go. Uh, if nobody has one, I'll, I'll close out with just a word to those uh, who are watching. Um, next week, uh, Isaiah 39, we will finish uh, book one of Isaiah. Um, and then in two weeks, we will begin book two of Isaiah, 40 through 55 talking about the Jews in captivity. Um, and m most Hebrew scholars believe Isaiah wrote 1 through 35. They say that 36 through 39 were added. They were an appendage by someone who worked on kings to give an explanation for why the Jews went in to Babylonian captivity. So it's, it's, like a, it's like a transition. And that's why, from a historical, chronological narrative standpoint, um, book one ends at Isaiah um, 37 with the defeat of the Assyrians, even added by somebody else who was there. But Isaiah's writings finish in 35. And then you've got four chapters with the final two the specific transition to why are they in captivity. And we will start Isaiah 40 by looking at the journey into captivity and just try to visualize what it would be like if the Chinese invaded the United States and forced us into enslavement camps in Mexico. If that ever happens, I want to go to Cabo. But other than that... <laughs> God bless you. Thank you all for watching. 
We will see you next Friday. Go Sooners!